All right, so thanks everybody for coming. I'd like to welcome Dr. Antonio Rolda, uh, formerly of JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley. You work on Bitcoin there as well? Uh, not officially, just uh, unofficially. Um, <laughs> and now I own startup uh, Muse.ai. Looking for the Bitcoin AI. Okay, just one piece of information. We have some drinks afterwards, so if anybody wants to hang around, discuss Bitcoin, or if you're going to talk, um, cool. please feel free to. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, and thank you to inviting me for giving this talk. Um, um, like that, like we said, uh, I'm going to talk about Bitcoin. I'm going to, I'm going to talk about
time I heard it, around 2009. Uh, there was a lot of connotations to it, a lot of libertarian things, a lot of associations with best out, best out.
mentioned, so, such as Git or ZFS. Um, and you know, everybody knows about uh, hash maps and things like that, where you can bucket things. And obviously, with the same principle, you can do sharding, especially now that we have a lot of big data machines and distributed amongst a lot of computers. So hashing function has a, have a lot of different applications. And one of the, the applications that Bitcoin uses it for is to make sure that the whole history of events uh, is correct. So if anybody comes back and changes a little bit or a little number, the whole change gets invalidated. But it also uses hashing functions to uh, control the mining process. And I'm going to get a little bit deeper into that in, in a minute. And it uses it for two different things, which I think is pretty kind of uh, special. Another application of uh, hashing functions, which I haven't really seen happening in, in yet, is that imagine you have an invention and you write a document about it. You can create a you can create a hash of that document, share it amongst people, and then maybe in ten years' time, when somebody invents that and you want to claim that you were the inventor of this thing, you can probably just say that look, I have produced this hash in 2015, which I think that that probably has some implications for things like intellectual property office where you probably can still claim ownership of some ideas even though you haven't published it yet. Um, another key um, aspect of digital signature algorithms where uh, using the private public key you can um, sign messages, prove their identity, um, encrypt things, and obviously prove that you're the owner of some digital asset. Um, another important aspect of Bitcoin is that the whole history, the whole ledger, all the transactions that ever happened are shared amongst everybody. Um, so you have a public ledger. Um, and of course, there, this, this public ledger has to be distributed to a peer-to-peer -peer network so that everybody knows what the truth is and cannot easily manipulate it. And even if there's um, some nodes that become apart and those nodes become out of sync, eventually when they rejoin, there's a way to know which one was the biggest one and which one should be considered to be the, the real truth. And I think that most people kind of overlook is the, the aspect that there's actually a language embedded into Bitcoin. It's called script. And this language is not Turing complete, which means that you cannot have loops, which makes a lot of sense. If you created an infinite loop on one of the transactions, then the whole network could come to a halt. It's stack based, it's based on an old language, which some people hint that maybe the creators are of a certain type of generation. Um, it only evaluates the true or false. Um, it also allows the embedding of data. So you, this, that's where you can embed messages, timestamps, other hashings, or all sorts of different things. There's actually a website that you can go into and see a lot of the different stuff that people have embedded in it. Um, allows, uh, obviously has built-in cryptographic functions so that um, you can do a lot of this uh, locking and unlocking of uh, different coins. Um, and allows for non-trivial operators to move the signature, where you need at least a majority of, of signatures to be able to move the, the assets, which I think is something that is also underused in, in currently. But one of the other things that is pretty fascinating about Bitcoin is that it uses game theory, and it aligns the interests or the benefits. If you Essentially, if you can break the network, um, you can profit from it. And to profit from it, you have to maintain the network intact. So you have this kind of big cycle that you, know, you don't want to break it because otherwise the value goes to zero. Um, it has happened in the past that there was uh, um, the chains kind of diverged and there was problems. And because there's so many people involved in it, you could just uh, stop the whole um, process, fix the problem, and carry on from where, where you left. So there's, there's, there's been massive catastrophes which has been recovered from, and also most people don't know about. So I think. Given this high level um, aspects that enable Bitcoin, I think I'm going to go now uh, down into the details of uh, how Bitcoin really works and what the blockchain entices. So to understand Bitcoin, you need to know how you can cash and understand transactions. And there's essentially there's two types of transactions. There's one that is a standard transaction, and there's a coin based transaction. So every 10 minutes, there's a coin based transaction that's issued. And in those coin based transactions, is where Bitcoin comes into existence. And then what happens to those Bitcoins that come into existence is that they are allocated to somebody. And mostly of the time, they're allocated to the miner that um, found the solution to a certain problem. And then, for example, 
by the delay. Um, from then on, we have the standard transaction review. So the standard transactions, you have to source the viewpoint from somewhere, which eventually gives you a great view to a point view. And you have to specify where those views actually go. <coughs> this is a used cryptographic um, function to prove that you're the rightful owner of the source viewpoint, and then you block this viewpoint to somebody else that has to interpret the same thing. So in summary, you have two transactions, uh, output um, locked point view to the owner of some key. Um, you can embed messages, of course. And one of the interesting things is that the, on, on standard um, uh, transactions, the number of Bitcoins that are sourced have to be the, number, the exact same number of Bitcoins that are uh, output. And if you leave any, any kind of spare ones, those are function as reward for the miners. So that's what becomes an incentive for, for the miners. So I'm trans I source 10, 10 Bitcoins, I say nine Bitcoins to these different people, and then I leave one that I don't tell to anybody, and the miner just feeds that back into his own uh, uh, kind of reward. Um, what, what happens is that all of these transactions um, are put together, and they're hashed together into what's called the Merkle tree, which generates a, a number. This number is then put onto what's called a block. Um, and a block is comprised of this number plus the, num the, the hash of the previous block and a special nonce number, which is a random number. Then when you combine all these three numbers together, you hash twice um, you, and you produce this block, uh, this new block's hash, which then is going to be fed to the next one. Um, what happens with, the, with, with blocks is that there was eventually a block that was a number one. And this block is called the genesis. And the number that it has it was a number that uh, the, the creators of Bitcoin uh, chose and they, they selected. Um, all of the blocks have to eventually uh, reference this one back. Um, what happens is that one of these blocks is, is generated every 10 minutes. And there's a, an interesting process that happens to calibrate that this happens every 10 minutes. So if there's a lot of compute power, the difficulty becomes higher. If there's low compute power, the difficulty becomes lower. So it, it adjusts. And I think it takes about two weeks for it to, to be readjusted. Um, in the beginning, um, each of these blocks generated 50 Bitcoins. And then after four years or around two, 210,000 blocks, this number gets halved. And this is what happened. This this halves continues until there's zero bitcoins that get mined eventually. Um, currently, there's um, this is being done at 25 bitcoins a block. Um, so there's also a limit to the um, block size, which is currently at one megabyte. And this has quite serious implications, which means that you can only do about seven transactions a second. So when I mean, a lot of people say that you can probably use bitcoin for currency of a country or or, or something like that. Um, if they know about this, they probably would think that that's an uh, unreasonable thing to, to, to say. However, uh, there's already a proposal to create Bitcoin XT that uh, in next year will uh, enable this number to go up to 8 megabytes and allowing for a lot more um, transactions to take place. So this mining process essentially involves this computation, which is you add the number, for instance, in this case, Bitcoin's already in version two, as you can see there's a two over there, which solved that problem when people have, what happens when Bitcoin 2.0 comes along? Bitcoin 2.0 already has come along. Um, and nothing stops it from continuing to enroll. This is the hash of the previous block. That's the Merkle wheel that represents all the transactions. Um, this is the time when this happens. This is the current difficulty. And this is the random number that, um, when computed together using this hash function, generates this number. So what happens is that when there's a lot of miners mining, you need to put a lot more zeros. So it typically becomes harder. So this, this becomes quite longer. Um, if, if all of a sudden half the miners go away, this number just becomes smaller. And you can see that all the zeros are quite comparable to those zeros that so this is just 10 minutes apart and the network wouldn't have changed much in that time. Um, there's also a really interesting aspect here is that um, as I'm going to reference later that this is a highly parallelizable problem. So you can have a lot of people that are just changing this number and seeing if the number that results is below a certain value. Um, and when we, we hear in the news saying that um, Bitcoin miners are solving really complex puzzles, the only puzzle they are really solving is just changing this number, running this computation, checking if it's below a certain value. 
I think that that's not really complex maths. It's kind of really saying that those guys in the casino are just trying to do something, they're really solving a complex math. They're not just rolling the dice. Um, so when you put all this together, you, you get to what's called the blockchain, where, of course, this is the Genesis block with a, a Genesis hash. And you know, obviously, you, have, you can't have any transactions because there was no Bitcoins before. Uh, but you generate 50 Bitcoins. These transactions that are here would have to necessarily um, reference this, this, uh, this Bitcoin that was generated there. And that, that's, that's what typically people, when they describe the blockchain, this is what they're really describing. However, you know, we, we probably heard a lot of people talking about blockchain and, and Bitcoin as if they were different things, and they are different things. Um, but some people try to separate Bitcoin from the blockchain in the sense that you can just have like your own private blockchain. Um, I think that that's kind of a little bit nonsensical, and I'm going to explain why. Um, essentially, this is important because you, if, if you have all these miners that are changing that number and creating those hashes, and nobody can control those miners, that means that nobody can rewrite that blockchain. If somebody can rewrite that blockchain, or there's a very limited amount of people able to rewrite that blockchain, then you're as good as having your own just private database or database where a few people kind of have read or write access to. Um, and what makes sure that nobody can do that is all these miners that get together into pools and try to solve that problem. And when, uh, when you have all these people gathering together, you obviously create a lot of different um, mining groups. And uh, as of today, this is the percentage, this is number of different mining groups, and this is the percentage of blockchain of blocks that they've mined. So you can see that nobody really has the majority right now. Um, I don't know if there's any questions in relation to this. Somebody briefly had 51%. Yes, somebody briefly had 51%. Um, I suppose that in the beginning, probably somebody had 100%. Um, and I think that there's also a kind of a few assumptions that could be made there. Even if somebody has 90% or, or something like that, it doesn't mean that they will do something bad. Of course, we wouldn't want that. Uh, we would want them to nobody to ever have the full control. Um, but one of the things that I think I missed, which is pretty crucial, is that the chain that has the, the highest difficulty is the chain that, that, that wins. So what happens is that I could fork another chain with my little mining rig, but when I rejoin the network, people will see that my difficulty was pretty low, and, and there's another chain that has a difficulty that's much higher. They will disregard my chain and just take the, the, the one that has the highest one. And this is pretty critical in the sense that sometimes networks can be isolated and they think they're still like the main network, but they're not really the main network. The main network is still uh, out there operating the internet. Um, so I was just, um, in terms of Bitcoin mining, this is uh, kind of an interesting graph because it shows us um, the 21 million is the limit of how many Bitcoins can be mined throughout the whole time. And we can see that the majority of them will be mined in the next few years. So that's why there's kind of a big race nowadays for people to mine and there's a lot of people investing on, on Bitcoin rates. And even though a lot of these people are probably not making a profit right now, the expectation is that in the future they, they might be able to do because they control that natural resource or that artificial resource. Um, so in terms of this resource, um, the mining fees and rewards. So we can see that miners have two incentives, fees and, and those coin bases. Um, so fees are discretionary amounts that are set by the sender, but there are some kind of guidelines about how much you should do it, uh, how much you should pay, which includes uh, 0 0.1 million bitcoins for every kilobyte that you, you add onto this. However, you can still have transactions that are done freely if your transaction is quite small and if your uh, output amounts are bigger than 0 0.1 bitcoins. And you've been long enough in the, in the kind of network waiting for that transaction to be processed. Um, the last bitcoin is predicted to be mined in 2136. Uh, um, and at that at that time, but obviously this, this is not going to be that deterministic. Um, so having spoken a little bit about the Bitcoin technology, the incentives, the mining, um, I was wondering if anybody has any questions before I move on to the next section. Sure. 
sorry, I didn't quite follow what it is the miners do. Are they trying to guess something? So the miners essentially are trying to find a number that is below some value. And this number obviously represents the, this, is, this adds onto the chain, so this represents the previous block. This one represents the transactions that have happened, so I can show you here. So this, this number represents all the transactions. This represents the hash of the previous chain of the previous block. And they're essentially trying to find out this number. And to find this number, they have to change this particular number and make sure that it, that it's all, it um, is within a certain difficulty level. And that's a trial and error process. That's a trial and error process. Hence the difficulty. Hence the difficulty. So the more people you have, the more trial and errors you can have at the same time. So the more difficulty it becomes to find that. How do you define the difficulty? So the difficulty is uh, every two weeks, the network uh, calibrates itself. So it knows that if, if on average there were a lot more blocks than they should be, then it should make the difficulty higher. If on average there were a lot less, then you should lower the difficulty. That makes any sense. So this number, will, that number will become a, a lot less, um, you require a lot less number of zeros on that. Sure. Yeah, so you mentioned uh, what will start seeing the production of the future of the process is currency, should be about to make a profit of it, should just be people using it. So why is it, what is it, what's the ultimate objective of it? Is it for something to profit of it? I use fans because I can pay, and I'm not going to accept them because I expect to profit from fans. Um, so the question, the question is to, to use it as a, as a currency or as a speculative asset. I think that that's, um, like there's this old way of thinking which makes perfect sense. And you can, think, you can think about it in those two regards and you can use it as a currency, you can use it as a speculative asset, but then there's something new. And I think this something new is what most people are missing. And the new thing is that essentially this is a new type of database. It's a database that never existed is a database that once you add something to it, nobody can ever change it. And that's, perhaps from a computer science perspective, that's the most interesting aspect of it. And you can use it to timestamp things, um, you, you can use it to uh, put messages, and you know, pe people are saying that with this technology, maybe the pictures cannot rechange history, right? So you, you probably have a lot of cases where people went, went back in time and kind of rewrote history because it was to their benefit. But with this, maybe you cannot do that anymore. So we will have a lot more you know, solid history of what, what events happened. Um, and I think that you know, in, in the digital world, it's very easy for somebody to just copy and paste something. But with this, you cannot copy and paste anymore. Um, so like you're talking about it as a coin that could be exchanged between people. You're actually transforming the coin, recording, who owned it before, who, who now owns it, is that right? That's exactly it. So you, you have essentially, um, let's see. So when I, when I was, so essentially what happens is that somebody, like the, the miner will own this lock. And when he uh, unlocks it, he uses his key, his private key, to prove that he's the owner. And then what he does, is he locks it to somebody else's key. So that's how he transfers to somebody else. And that could be a fraction of the Bitcoin, which you can go quite a quite lot. And what's to stop him having the option to give it to someone else? So Doing the same thing with, with another person. So the same that's, that's a really good question. So what happened, what blocks uh, mind some, somebody from s double spending? That's the yeah. technical term for me. So what happens is that everything is recorded. So you know exactly who owns it and where did it go to. So if, if the network sees that some coin is already, doesn't belong to this person anymore, that person cannot spend it. That makes any sense. Cool. Any, any more questions? All right. So now I'm going to move into more of the data points and uh, you know statistics about the Bitcoin. Um, 
So I think like, the most interesting one is that people probably want to see is the, the price evolution. So this, this plot is on a log scale, so you, and it has this, this trend line. So one of the things that most people probably remember was a couple of years ago, there was quite a few spikes around November uh, where Bitcoin reached uh, you know, above uh, $1,000. Um, and there was a lot of media hype about it being a bubble. But what people probably don't know is that the biggest bubble was actually a lot uh, earlier. And um, I think that perhaps the most fascinating was when maybe you know, it started valuing something more than $1. Um, and I don't know if you've been following the news, but in the last few days, Bitcoin price has gone up quite a lot as well. Um, and it was kind of hovering at around 250 and uh, yesterday morning, he went up to 502. Um, I think it received a little bit back into 400. But you can see if we, if we do the, the trend lines, it's still kind of like below what the trend line should, should expect it to be. Um, so one of the things that a lot of people ask is, and, and kind of try to figure out what is the real fair value of Bitcoin. I think that people can try to calculate this using how much uh, energy does it cost to mine? How much does the equipment cost? How much the operation cost? And then um, try to extrapolate from that. However, I think that that's probably not a really good idea because some people see different applications for it, like we just mentioned. Some people see it as just a, a way of payment, as a currency. Some people see it as a speculative asset. Some other people see all the other good things that can come out of it, as in terms of the technology, as in terms of its utility, as a, as a digital utility. Um, so I think that other interesting questions should, should revolve around you know, what will happen when miners do not have uh, Coinbase rewards anymore. Will they make the fees go up quite a lot to compensate for that, making quite prohibitively expensive to transact Bitcoins, and then maybe uh, making the whole point of Bitcoin not so valuable? Uh, will it make us pay more for, for electricity because your, your neighbor is now mining and he's kind of like sucking a lot more energy? Um, or will it um, make us in innovate in terms of energy, get more power plants, you know, maybe get some solar panels orbiting the sun or something like that, to, uh, and you know, go for cloud computing up to orbital computing. Um, I think that another, another interesting thing is, um, will we make our chips faster and more efficient? And I think that there's already been quite a lot of innovation that has happened in kind of designing of chips. And as you can see, initially, uh, people started mining on CPU. And quite quickly, they could see that they could get some performance increases if they went on to the GPUs. So they, they started mining using GPUs. Um, and then they, they started going really down to the hardware level using FPGAs, as, as you guessed. So they created a digital design that uh, did all these hashes and did all this processing really efficiently in, in hardware. Uh, once you have that on FPGA, it's very easy to, to convert that into a, an ASIC, and that's exactly what happened. And nowadays, I think you'd, you'd, you'd probably be silly to even try to mine on anything else than, a, than an ASIC. Uh, it would just be a waste of energy. Um, in terms of mining rigs, this is how mining rigs used to look at a few years ago. And uh, this is an FPGA one. Um, and you know, quite quickly, you know, people start getting really professionals onto this, and they started. Now this is what they what they look like. And like I was mentioning earlier, there are there are people that um, account for so much of the energy, the, the hardware, all these things that they even move to countries where it's uh, the, the energy is cheaper. Um, so with with this, hash rates have gone up quite significantly. So this is another plot that is on the, on a low scale. And what is interesting is that when, when the price is, is, uh, is kind of like stable, there's not much um, mining increase. When the price goes up, a lot of people jump onto the, onto the wagon. And at the same time, you can see that there's a lot of efficiencies. This line um, probably <coughs> signifies a little bit of uh, the human ability to do computations. So when we, if we still continue to innovate and continue to get things efficiently, we'll probably still see the hash rates going up. This is probably a good proxy for that. Um, obviously, to compensate this, difficulty rates had also to go up. Um, 
Another interesting aspect is the, the number of all these transactions need to be stored. And the, uh, the, the transactions now, the whole database is about 20, uh, 46, I think, gigabytes, which if you download the, the client and you want to do Bitcoin operations, you know, the, it's kind of freaky because you will see your, your network really flashing a lot and you will see your list just being taken over. And if you're not aware of this, you might sound like you've got a virus or something on the computer. So there's so much progress, right? This is still uh, estimated that 2,146 will be the data all over the points online, or will it be sooner? Um, because the, the network calibrates itself to produce a block every 10 minutes, um, even if there's like a lot more hash rate, that will still be the time because it kind of like just the gaps. So and this is exactly what what you see here. So, so this is this is hash rates going up, and this is the difficulty going up. So to compensate, so that that still is the same data. Uh, let me go that first. I understand quite quickly how many people will take the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. So supply and demand. So, so the, the question is about the value, and is the value, uh, you know, what people are supposed to pay for, are willing to pay for it? And the underlying algorithms. Yes, they're, they're fundamentally a function of the underlying algorithms. If if people didn't trust that the underlying algorithms were secure or safe enough or sound enough, they uh, wouldn't want to invest in this. They wouldn't want to, you know, kind of, uh, you know, trust the network and you know even have Bitcoin stored. So one of the first things that I did was exactly that. I, I downloaded the codes, start looking at the algorithms, start understanding how they worked, and you know. Kind of silly of me to think that I could find a vulnerability in it, and you know I'm not the only one that thought about that. I think there's a lot of other people. I'm going to find something wrong, and you know what? I think I didn't find anything wrong. I find it really elegant. I think the people that put it together somehow they pretty, pretty ingenious the way that they did it. But I think that um, there's there's a I believe, and I might be wrong. There's a lot more value to Bitcoin than we understand. Just make a proxy with the internet. When the internet started to come out, it was essentially if the US got attacked, you would have a network that could launch the missiles back. So it was kind of like distributed, so there was no single point of failure. The internet evolved to disrupt a lot of businesses, such as you know, now a lot of people talk about Uber, how that is just disrupting like the transport business. So I think with the Bitcoin technology, there's going to be a lot of other things that are going to be disrupted. Um, and you know the things that we think about now they're pretty obvious like you know remittances and things like that but I think there's a lot more to it that we just can't see and I think that's you know, the new stuff that a lot of that's why a lot of VCs in the valley are kind of pouring money into this and uh, I think that there's going to be more value to it so it's it's a lot of different things that determine the value And so everything started with this Genesis block, right? Is there anything that will stop me to create another Genesis block and therefore launch another currency? And will you see a future where there will be multiple electronic <coughs> currencies? So that's a really good question. So the question is, can I just get another Genesis and start my own blockchain? Yes, you can. Uh, and a lot of people have done that. Yeah, you know, if you if you look, there's loads of different currencies, um, and what what happens is again making a parallel to the internet. Nothing stops you from starting your own local network, and you know, kind of adding people onto this local network. And of course, its network is still using the blockchain as in TCP, IP, and all this on the line. But if that network is only in your house, only in your building, only in your city, then it doesn't have the advantages of a global network with all the miners that secure it. And it's the same with Bitcoin. You you can have your own blockchain. You know, banks can have their own private blockchains. But without the whole mining behind it, they're as good as having their own 
local area network for your database. That makes any sense. So it's about critical mass. The Bitcoin has reached critical mass, so people can have confidence in it. But, but there are going to be others all the time willing to, to trade in it. Exactly. Where, whereas something now is trying to start up, it's not going to reach critical mass. That's, that's my opinion. I might be wrong, but uh, that's the way I view it. And it's the same if you want to start an internet now, you might start a small network, but to really get the benefits of the internet, you have to join what we call the internet right now. What about other trends? For instance, will uh, quantum computing, if ever comes to reality, will affect the mining process? Because potential there is immense. If quantum computing comes, I think that what will probably happen is that maybe we will stop the blockchain at a certain time, move on to the equivalent of the blockchain in quantum computing. Because you can run similar algorithms that achieve the same thing in quantum computing. Does that make any sense? Uh, your question? So it's just around the basis of the value. You mentioned that who is the key, you basically lose that currency. Yes. Does this mean that, well, one, we have the idea of how much of these Bitcoins we've lost already, and then does it mean like entropy will kick in eventually because people will be losing at the time it's trying to be asset item and there's value on the way? So that's that's an interesting question. We'll, because there's a limited amount of coins, people will lose the keys, will eventually they lose their value. What happens is that Bitcoin can be divisible infinite. So as long as you have one anywhere, you can just re rebase and kind of go down from that point, if that makes any sense. So this is again, you know, pe some people live in a kind of limited world where the world is fixed. Some people live in a world where maybe you can find another way. And that's another way to solve that problem. Um, is there any other questions? Or um, normal currencies associated with the country and that's a, uh, the payment, so on and so the value of the currency will fluctuate because of that. What about Bitcoin? Is there, is there something that, that similarly will cause to gain confidence, lose confidence, and therefore fluctuate? Oh, all the time. All the, like, uh, we just saw it uh, recently, right? The price is going up quite a lot in, the, in this last few days. Um, I think it's very hard to really know what really drives the prices up or prices down. It could just be some billionaire that all of a sudden says, I believe in this and I'm going to just kind of buy it as much as I can. And all of a sudden, just the price just goes up because he's, he's buying it. And if you look at it at the value of $6 billion, it probably is not going to take a lot of money to really drive the price up quite significantly. So I think that there's, there's a lot of subjectivity to you know, what, what the volatility of it um, is. I think that most people, again, compare Bitcoin to currencies and that's the model that they have, or the, that model or, or a commodity. You know, cryptocurrencies are a thing in their own right. They have a box of their own. They're not like one or the other. And I think that that's why, you know, when you have, um, I should probably shouldn't say this, because I'm more, I, I typically try to do this presentation more on the technology side and not so much on the philosophical or kind of like currency aspects of it. But I think that when, when law is made to all these new things, um, you can make a parallel. So imagine that when the internet started, I, start, I tried to regulate it straight away and I started telling people, oh, the internet is being used to sell drugs, the internet is going to be used to do all these bad things. We have to know everybody that gets on the internet. We have to get, a, you know, like they're trying to do with a big license where everybody has to be identified. Then a lot of the benefits of the internet wouldn't have happened if that was the case. And this is perhaps what's happening with Bitcoin. The people are wanting to try to legislate it straight away without letting it flourish and without letting a lot of people, you know, maybe do a little mistakes and maybe do little things that are probably not not right, like you know, and Mark Cox. Uh, you know, I don't want to defend the guy because I think the guy probably, you know, I don't know exactly what happened, but I think that things like that are probably natural with things that are in its infancy. Um, and if you look at the history of a lot of technologies, there was initially a lot of people that probably did things that were not so good to it. Um, so I think that's, that's, that's my take on, on that. Uh, carry, carrying on, so um, the average block size, um, is, as I said earlier, it, it, has, it has a limit of one megabyte. And uh, if we look at the whole historical graph, we can see that it's reaching almost like the limit. And that's why um, some people in the community really want to increase the, this limit. 
Uh, some people in the community don't want to increase this limit, and that create, is creating a little bit of a lift. Um, I think that you know, my personal opinion is that maybe it should increase a little bit, just because computers are always increasing, and we have more bandwidth, we have more storage. So probably like should should go a little bit up as well. Um, but when you know when we hit that hard limit, maybe we'll, people will start losing transactions, and maybe the people will have to pay more for transaction fees and things like that. Sorry, I might have missed any. But what does the block size relate to? Why is the block size? So the block size. Um, is where all the transactions they happen within 10 minutes are stored. So if you have, you know, the current size of one megabyte limits it to about seven transactions per second. So you have a bigger one, you can obviously store more information. More information. So it's an index of how many transactions are performed in time. Yeah. In time. yeah. Exactly. And I think that the the whole rationale behind this is that you want to have a limit. Because if you don't have a limit, then people can just uh, you know attack this, the the network and just stop putting all sorts of rubbish in that. Uh, also, another important aspect is it's important for the network to be accessible to the common individual on the street. Like I can just go uh, to PC World, get a machine, and set up another home. If I if, if this limit doesn't exist. All of a sudden, maybe I need to run a you know kind of enterprise production ready system to just be able to keep track of it. So by creating this limit, it allows a lot of people to still be able to uh, be part of the network. Um, so all these all these transactions and all these blocks, uh, you can go onto a block explorer like at blockchain.info, which is one of my favorite ones, and you can see exactly the transactions that are happening uh, uh, here, um, uh, practically like in real time. And you can have, you can see the, the different blocks. So you can see that, for instance, here uh, there was two blocks that happened almost like you know, next to each other. Um, this ones are more closer to the ten minutes that they should really be. Um, and these are the mining groups that uh, found those those blocks, and that is the size of, of that block. Um, so I think that's you know, if you want to explore and learn more about this, this is a really good way of doing it. Um, more uh, current statistics are. Um, we're about almost like 400,000 blocks. Um, uh, time between blocks is about nine minutes, which means that you know, the next difficulty is going to go up. Well. Um, this number is really fascinating. You know, if you look at it, um, six million petaflops. That, in terms of compute power, is gigantic. Just to give you some perspective, the top 500 computer, which is a super, the, the fastest supercomputer on, on the planet. Uh, we would need a hundred of those to even match that. So this is what really makes Bitcoin safe, and what really makes it, you know, kind of um, useful in relation to other private blockchains. Um, a slide that I, I don't have here, but I think I should have had, is one that shows in the beginning when a lot of these uh, coins started to um, show, the the mining of their uh, um, the mining rigs were not so smaller compared to Bitcoin. But if you look at them now, like Bitcoin is a massive, and those others are really like tiny little blobs. Um, and if the Bitcoin community were to like diverge a little bit onto the side, they probably could rewrite a lot of the other alternative coins just to prove a point that they are useless. Um, I'm kind of like, maybe I shouldn't say this because there's a lot of people that are very passionate about their own currencies and, you know, kind of, so I'm sorry that I don't mean it in that way. I mean it in that more like technical way. Um, so the market cap nowadays it's about uh, six six billion dollars. Um, a few days ago it was probably like three billion dollars. Um, and uh, the transaction volumes is, have have also spiked around to 2014, <laughs> and they've been spiking quite a lot recently because the the new kind of uh, uh, price going up quite significantly. Um, with this with a uh, like more talks like this, with a lot more people understanding about Bitcoin, um, the adoption of Bitcoin has been going up, and you can see this by the number of people that are opening wallets. And there's a pretty steep curve. This this slide is not um, the latest one. The latest one would be a little bit even a little bit more steep. So since I've spoken a lot about these numbers, I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, the open source libraries and resources that you have available to start you know, playing around with. It. Before I do that, just want to answer the question. Currencies value are often determined by what 
to physical Okay, so that's, I, I, got, I got the question. The question is, is really good. Um, and the question is what um, kind of, when, when we have a commodity such as gold, there's an, under, uh, an underlying value of gold that can use it to make watches, that can make it to do all sorts of other things. Uh, with Bitcoin, what's the underneath value of it? What's the utility of it? And you know, if you if you come from an old world, you probably do not see digital utility. You don't know what that even means. Actually, I think I've never read this anywhere, but it's a concept that kind of with time matured in my head. So there's Bitcoin that allows this digital utility. That, for instance, if you don't have Bitcoins, you cannot have messages onto this chain that is immutable and should stay here forever. Um, so the digital utility of Bitcoin is exactly that. It's to give you right access to the, this database that nobody can change. And what can you do with writing? You, you can do so much with writing. Just uh, think about the, the old traditional world. Just by enable writing things, you can do uh, you know, patents, you can do legal documents, you can do all this proof of identities, all these different things. Um, and a lot more of those that I kind of tried to mention that I don't even know about. And there we don't know that. It's only going to be like, in, I don't know, a few years' time. It's going to, going to become obvious. And it's going to become one of those things. Yeah, everybody knows about it, right? Um, so the, the Bitcoin's value also has that digital tool. Also has this utility of, I can be, you know, imagine you, you, have, you have a son that's traveling around the world and you want to send him money. Um, there's a lot of this. Uh, ATMs of Bitcoin, they are spread all over the world. You can, he can give you the key um, for his account, and you can just send money to that. Within minutes, he's going to receive that. He can go to one of these ATMs and withdraw that. If you have to do, if you have to do that using the traditional method, you know, maybe his card was stolen, maybe his card was lost, or something like that. That is another utility that becomes obvious in the world sense of, you know, of our current economy. So that's another utility they can apply. And there's so many other kind of uses for it. I just want to explore the scalability of this system because a uh, Bitcoin transaction is essentially a money transaction. I write it on my Right. 13 transactions a second, which is what we reported, seems really rather low. Uh, if you go to any bank, you're going to find money transfer transactions that are made down per second. So clearly, it can't displace. If, if there is a limit on that transaction rate, it clearly can't displace conventional payment systems. Um, and, and there also seems to be other limits built in terms of the number of blocks that you can create ever, and so on. Am, am I right in assuming this? It, it appears as if it's a system that is going to saturate, not very far in the future. Yes, there is there is there are certain limitations to it. So the number of transactions per second is, is obviously a big one. So when people say that you know you could use Bitcoin for a currency of a country or something like that, you know, that's they, they don't really know enough information about the current state of Bitcoin to um, you know to make those claims. But you know, without a challenge, there's an opportunity. So nothing stops a company from having a small uh, um, trust in the sense that you can do a lot of small transactions and then settle on the Bitcoin. And um, so you can see Bitcoin is being used as a, as like a, a top level settlement system where you know the small transactions can be taken care of by somebody else. And then those people can do really fast transactions. So for instance if you um, if you go to an exchange that trades Bitcoin now, you can you can obviously transact Bitcoin in dollars really quickly. Um, and those things happen within the database of that of that exchange, um, so you can still have something like that. Of course, you lose a little bit of the whole um, uh, benefit of non mutability, but maybe if you're talking about small transactions, nobody cares. Like if if you lose maybe you know, a few things, 
So do I understand you correctly? You're saying that it might be appropriate for very large transactions, big monetary value, which would then restrict it to interbank transfers, this kind of stuff. Yes. Um, which is the price of swing today. Um, is, is that, am I correct? In yes, that? And, you are, you are totally correct. I don't fit with any of the democratization objectives of making available to the man on the street. Well, the democratization of made it available to the man on the street, there's, that can be interpreted in various different ways. I think it's democratic in the sense that I could just go to my computer at home and do it. I don't need to ask anybody for permission. Um, if, But it's vulnerable. If somebody uh, tries to uh, take over a lot of Bitcoins and hoard them or something and not allow other people to use them, then that's kind of market. There's a marketplace for that. And then what happens there is um, game theory kicks in. So if it's not a fair system and if it's a system that people perceive as not being transparent, then people start not using it. And when they start not using it, the value goes down and then you know, <coughs> and then it kind of adjusts itself. That makes any sense. You have a question? Yeah, yeah well, a question. Well, maybe first comment, which is that so, well, I mean, there are some let's say requirements for transactions that where you can't just say, well, I mean, there's limitations of them. Well, I'm something to work upon. Um, so that's 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 one of the ways that you can you can solve that problem. So you have the power to make sure that those transactions are incorporated into the, the blockchain. Yeah. I mean, the, the other question that I wonder about is this.
Um, and there are also like um, projects that uh, alert you when the price is moving. And uh, I actually have a little uh, iWatch application that kind of tells me when the price reaches certain thresholds. And this few days, it's been like going crazy. Um, if you want to create your own personalized address, um, uh, this is how easy it is. You just need to uh, get uh, Python, install this uh, library called PyCoin, import from import wall from it, and essentially you just uh, um, run this create a seed. From that seed, you um, uh, create um, a master wallet, and then you can just get your address. In this case, I have this while loop just because the first time I gave this presentation was at the Python for Quants conference. And I just wanted 